I don't remember exactly when I became a mystery buff, but I do remember when I first saw a film on TV based on an Agatha Christie mystery. More accurately, it was a parody of an Agatha Christie. And, and then, then there, there were none. none. The children's show Square One TV, which ran Mondays through Fridays, had a segment at the end of each episode called MathNet, a parody of Dragnet. Each week's worth of episodes formed a miniseries culminating in the solving of a case. Just before airing their final season, Square One TV released one set of MathNet episodes as a short film. The Case of the Mystery Weekend, or The Case of the Blind Justice as I remember it. Several people receive a mysterious invitation to spend the weekend at a creepy remote mansion. Once there, they start disappearing one by one. What was that? B flat, man. Eventually, only two are left. And that means one conclusion. Which is? One of us did it. While I wouldn't really call this film an adaptation, the premise of the story is very similar to its source material, the Agatha Christie novel, and then there were none. A quick note, I am not going to reveal the solution to this mystery, but there are still major spoilers forthcoming. You have been warned. And Then There Were None was written in 1939. It went through a series of titles before arriving at the less offensive current version. In the story, ten people are lured to a large house on a remote island, where a tape recording accuses them all of having committed murder. At first they denounce the charges as lies, but in the end all the accusations turn out to be true. They're all guilty, but only in the moral sense, not the legal. Hence the reason they were never brought to justice, until now. One by one they are executed in ways that allude to the nursery rhyme Ten Little Indians, or Ten Little Soldier Boys in more recent editions. Much later we find out that the order of victims was determined by their degree of moral guilt, from least to greatest. Eventually only two suspects are left alive, creating mutual suspicion. One of them kills the other and then commits suicide. The police arrive and they find evidence that someone was still alive after the tenth death. But there's no possible way there was an eleventh person on the island, so they're stumped. It isn't until a message in a bottle is found and delivered to them that the truth is revealed. Christie adapted the novel into a stage play in 1943 with a slightly different ending, but the murderer is still the same. Most films use the new ending, others use the original one. This is one of the best-selling mystery titles in the world. As such, it's had many many film and TV adaptations, too many to count, and definitely too many to cover in a single video. Unless... So I'm going to deviate from my usual format here. Instead of going through the plots of book and film bit by bit and pointing out the similarities and changes, we're going to go through several of the films and decide which one is the best film overall. Because I have a background in martial arts, we're going to do this tournament style. The entrants will each compete in various events, and the winners will receive points. At the end, we'll tally up the points to see who's the champion. So, who are the entrants? 1945, and then there were none, the very first film adaptation. Since many of these films have similar titles, I'm going to refer to most of them by their production year. 1965, Ten Little Indians. 1974, and then there were none, billed in the U.S. as Ten Little Indians. 1989, Ten Little Indians. Um, actually, no. I'm, I'm not going to include this one. It's... Really, really bad. I don't want to watch it a second time. It's one redeeming feature is that it has Donald Pleasance. It's like, dude, why are you here? You are too talented to be part of this thing. Go back to Haddonfield. Or Spectre. For similar reasons, I'm going to say the 1995 film Suspicions is disqualified. Honestly, was this a student film or what? There's also an adaptation that is a porn film called Ten Little Maidens, so, um, no. And no, I haven't watched it. No, seriously, I haven't... whatever. What else have we got? Mindhunters? Hmm. I'm gonna say 
no. Its similarities to the Agatha Christie story are superficial at best. However, I am going to include the 2003 film Identity. As loose an adaptation as it is, at least it pays homage to its inspiration. Remember that movie where the ten strangers went to an island, and then they all died one by one? The 2010 episode of Family Guy, titled And Then There Were Fewer, obviously also is an homage, but that too falls more into the category of parody. Plus, I'm not really a Family Guy guy, so yeah, no. Sorry. I am tempted to include Rooster Teeth's Ten Little Roosters miniseries, but that's really also a parody, so no. We do have one more entrant, however, and that's the 2015 miniseries And Then There Were None. Yes, I know, I know, there are so many more films I haven't mentioned. I thought about including the 1987 Russian version, which I have seen, without subtitles, so I didn't understand a word, but I think five is enough. Just to recap, those five are 1945, 1965, 1974, 2015, and Identity. Let the tournament begin! Let's start with a brief overview of the book's original characters in the order in which they're introduced. Lawrence Wargrave, a judge who was accused of deliberately sentencing an innocent man to death. Vera Claythorne, a secretary-slash-former governess accused of murdering a child under her care. Philip Lombard, an adventurer accused of murdering 21 East African tribesmen. Yikes. Emily Brent, a Puritan accused of killing a teenage girl. General MacArthur. This was before a real-life General MacArthur played a prominent role in World War II, so in the stage play the name was changed to Mackenzie. He's accused of murdering one of his own subordinates during World War I. Edward Armstrong, a doctor accused of killing one of his patients. Anthony Marston, a young millionaire accused of killing a married couple. William Bloor, a former police officer accused of killing an innocent man and Thomas and Ethel Rogers, the butler and the maid, a husband and wife accused of murdering a former employer. The judge's name changes a few times throughout the movies. Sometimes so does his motive. In one, he says the guy deserved to be hanged even though he wasn't a murderer. In another, he says he did it to ruin the reputation of a rival who happened to be the guy's defense attorney. In the last one, he insists the man was guilty. Vera's name also gets switched around, as well as her nationality, but in all except the 2015 version, her crime is changed to killing her sister's fiancé. Later, she says it was actually her sister who killed him, but she covered up for her. 2015 retains the original revelation that Vera secretly gave the boy permission to swim too far, causing him to drown, so that the family fortune would pass to the man she wanted to marry. Lombard's first name was changed to Hugh when he was played by American actor Hugh O'Brien, because, I don't know, maybe the actor liked his own name better? In 1965 and 1974, his crime is changed to killing a woman he got pregnant. However, in those two and 1945, it's revealed that he's not Lombard after all. He's a friend of Lombard. The real Lombard committed suicide, and his friend came here to find out why. 2015 stuck to the original Lombard, or did they? Book Lombard left the tribesmen to die, but film Lombard slaughtered them. We'll see this kind of change in other characters, too. Emily Brent turns into a younger, very non-Puritan film actress in 1965 and 1974, and her backstory is different from the book in every adaptation. Her original crime was kicking a teenage girl out of the house when she discovered the girl was pregnant. As a result, the girl committed suicide. Three adaptations changed the identity of her victim, who still committed suicide. 2015 keeps the victim the same, but adds an element of sexual attraction that doesn't make sense and isn't really necessary to the plot. In the book, the general discovered his wife was having an affair with one of his men, so he sent the man to an area in the war where he'd be likely to die. And it worked. 2015 changes this to the general pulling the trigger himself, literally, which I think goes against the whole point that legally these killers are all in the clear. 1965 and 1974 change it such that the general mistakenly sent men to die, which is also a huge flaw, because that is not murder in any sense of the word. 
Dr. Armstrong is the most consistent of all the characters throughout the adaptations. He was drunk when he operated on a woman, resulting in her death. Each film has him to a T. Anthony Marston, who ran over two people while speeding, is transformed into a professional entertainer in the first three films. The book emphasizes his youth, his Norse god-like appearance, which makes it a shock when he's the first to die. This is captured most accurately by 2015, though in that film his victims are changed to two children. Bloor, in the book, committed perjury and deliberately sent an innocent man to prison, where he died. This is kept in every adaptation except 2015, which makes the same alteration as it did with Lombard and the General, turning this into a more direct killing. The only other change is his physical appearance. The book describes him as a big man with a military bluster. The film version of him that comes closest is 1974, with 1965 a close second. The Rogerses committed their murder through deliberate negligence, but again, 2015 takes this passive choice and turns it into a more violent act. I know it's probably more dramatic, but I think there could be just as much drama in portraying it the way Christie wrote it. You could have Rogers withholding the medicine even as the dying lady begs for help. Plus, it's the passivity of these heinous acts that makes them seem justifiable in the eyes of their perpetrators. Until now. Rogers' only other significant alteration occurred in 1965, where they buffed him up so he could have a fist fight with Hugh O'Brien. Identity, being an original story, has its own set of characters, of which there are eleven, not ten. They're stranded at a desert motel, where someone kills them off one by one. And Then There Were None features a platter with ten figurines, one of which is broken each time someone dies. Identity's equivalent of this is a numbered room key that's left beside each victim. Later, we learn that all these people are personalities of a single man. In this dreamscape, one of them is killing off the rest so that it can have full control of the man's body. So, Instead of just choosing winners based on how well the characters emulate their book counterparts, I'm also going to judge this event based on how well the characters serve the story that they're in. By that reasoning, the gold medal clearly goes to 1945, bronze goes to identity, and silver is a tie between 1965 and 2015. Bronze medal gets one point, silver gets two, and gold gets three. Each film features what was, at its time, an all-star cast. 1945 has the voice of the Caterpillar from Disney's Alice in Wonderland, and Topper from the Topper Trilogy. 1965 has Wyatt Earp, a dude from 1970's Battlestar Galactica, and a Bond girl from Goldfinger. It also has Christopher Lee, whose voice reads out the accusations. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your host speaking. My name is U.N. Owen. I have brought you here to charge you with the following crimes. Speaking of Goldfinger, in 1974 we have Goldfinger, plus the villain from Thunderball. We also have John Hammond from Jurassic Park, and the guy who gets tormented in the Pink Panther movies. And it's Orson Welles on the tape recording. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your host speaking. My name is U.N. Owen. In identity, we have... Well, who don't we have? There's John Cusack, Alfred Molina, Ray Liotta, Amanda Peet, Claire Duvall, and... Is that Dr. Cox? And in 2015, we have we have Charles Dance, Toby Stevens, Byrne Gorman, Miranda Richardson, and Sam Frickin' Neal. Let's take a closer look at each film's leads. 1945's central characters are played by Lewis Hayward and June Dupre. Hayward plays Lombard as unrealistically cheerful and aloof, and Dupre tries to portray Vera as frightened and tense, but it comes off as just flat. In 1965, the leads are Hugh O'Brien and Shirley Eaton, both of whom are impressively dynamic. They go back and forth between being lovers and mortal enemies, and it's totally believable. Even when Eaton's character is in shock, unlike Dupre, she still has a strong stage presence. In 1974, the leads are played by Oliver Reed and... Um... I don't know how to pronounce this. Elk? Elka? Elka Sommer. 
or summer. Anyway, Reed's portrayal of Lombard seems somewhat arbitrary. Sometimes he's on edge, other times he's laughing at nothing. Summer overplays her part in a few scenes and underplays it in others. The chemistry between them is... interesting. In Identity, John Cusack and Amanda Peet go very well together. One is a burned-out cop with a tortured soul, the other is a former prostitute looking to start a new life. Throughout the ordeal, they achieve a mutual respect, capturing the essence, if not the letter, of Lombard and Vera, the stage play version, that is. The novel version of the two characters is best represented by 2015, wherein Lombard and Vera, portrayed by Aidan Turner and Maeve Dermody, are overtly antagonistic to begin with, but grudgingly accept each other as allies for the sake of survival. Lombard amuses himself by getting under Vera's skin, but in the end she's proven to be the sharper of the two. All right, time to award the medals. 1945 and 1974 are out of the running, though I did like Richard Attenborough's performance. I might be biased toward my own generation, but I'm going to give the bronze medal to 1965, silver to identity, and gold to 2015. Nineteen forty five and nineteen sixty five have a lot of the same dialogue, much of which is taken directly from the book. You just said there's no one on this island. In the sense you mean no. Nevertheless, I'm now certain that Mr. Owen is here. How can he be here? I don't believe in the invisible man. He's not invisible. Mr. Owen is one of us. <laughs> Tell you one thing, there's no one in this house. We've searched the place from top to bottom. No one? In the sense you mean, no. But I'm now quite certain that Mr. Owen is here. How can he be? An invisible man, Judge. Not invisible, Mr. Lombard, but isn't it obvious? Mr. Owen is one of us. <laughs> 1974 has almost exactly the same dialogue as 1965, some of which doesn't make sense in this new setting. Do you think I could kill three people from whose death I cannot even profit? Now, dear boy, there's no need to be like that. We thought you might know a way down. We can't stay here. There's no path you could travel. Ah, and there is a way. Dangerous even for an expert climber. You could be sure of death on the Devil's Leap, Mr. Blore. Devil's Leap, that's well named. Tell me, who lived? People who were tired of life. Do you think I would kill three people from whose death I cannot profit? Now look, my friend, don't be like that. We just thought you may know a way to get out of here. There is no way you could travel. Ah, there is a way. Maybe. But I'm not saying any more. It may be the death of me. Or you. So, in 1965, the butler's way out is to climb down the mountain. In 1974, the hotel they're in is 200 miles from anywhere. So, his secret way out is to... be well prepared? To be fair, 1965 had this same weakness. What's wrong, Doctor? Oh, I see. You and I, well, we are alone in the house. Lombard! Lombard! Come here! Don't leave us! What's wrong, Doctor? Oh, I see. We're alone, you and I. Lombard! Then again, there were a greater number of scenes where I thought they improved it. Look, I don't mind being killed. But I hate like the devil to be killed for someone else. Didn't I tell you I wasn't Lombard? In the first place, I don't want to get killed. In the second place, I sure as hell don't want to get bumped off for someone else. I told you I'm not Lombard. You expect me to believe that now? 2015, as faithful as it is to the book, has nearly all original dialogue, which is rife with tension and malicious undertones. We must be strong, Mrs. Rogers, especially in these times. We must be valiant. And virtuous. 
Or we must be English women. Yes, madam. And a little advice. In future, a splash of eau de cologne before you come upstairs to attend on the ladies. I appreciate it's hot work in the kitchen, but there's no need to announce it quite so emphatically. Beg your pardon, madam. In Identity, probably the best dialogue is set aside for Alfred Molina's character, the psychiatrist treating the man with multiple personality disorder. When faced with an intense trauma, a child's mind may fracture creating disassociated identities. That's exactly what happened to Malcolm Rivers. Why are you telling me this? Because you, Edward, are one of his personalities. I would love to keep showing you clips, but this video is going to be super long as it is, so let's skip ahead to the awards. For best dialogue, I'm giving bronze to identity, silver to 1965, and gold to 2015. The book's original setting of a remote island off the Devon coast is retained in the 1945 film. The house is pretty obviously made up of mats, cycloramas, and set pieces, but given that the film was made in the same time period as the novel, the set is quite authentic. 1965 changes the setting to a castle on a mountain in the Swiss Alps, a bit of a jump geographically, but it fits in with the now international cast of characters. Creepy, isn't it? It serves all the functions of the story just as well as the island did. He's been dead for hours. For hours? Since the last tide. No footprints around the body. He's been dead for hours. How do you know? It hasn't snowed since last night. The only footprints are ours. 1974 takes us even farther, to a hotel in the middle of an Iranian desert. Um, I don't know. If they really wanted to make a deserted hotel seem creepy, they should have brought in Stanley Kubrick. Here, it feels awkward and out of place, and they didn't make as good use of the location as 1965 did. Identity takes place primarily at a roadside motel in the middle of Nevada, during a rainstorm. Whoever came up with this did a slam-dunk job of getting the most out of it. The movie is worth multiple viewings just for the set alone. Before I talk about 2015, here's a descriptive passage from the book. If this had been an old house, with creaking wood and dark shadows, there might have been an eerie feeling. But this house was the essence of modernity. There were no dark corners, no possible sliding panels. Everything was new and bright and shining. There was nothing hidden in this house, nothing concealed. It had no atmosphere about it. Somehow, that was the most frightening thing of all. This works great as a metaphor for when the characters desperately search for a secret hiding place where you and Owen could be concealed, which of course he isn't because he's one of them. What they're really searching for is something sinister outside of them, not wanting to recognize the darkness in themselves. Whoever designed the set for 2015 must have read this description because they reproduced it word for word. And that's exactly why it doesn't work. This kind of location is perfect for a book, but for a visual medium, not so much. A dull, drab, emotionally neutral place like this sucks out the tension that each scene works so hard to build. The metaphor it represents is already lost, for separate reasons. By contrast, the island itself is breathtaking. I mean, look at this thing! When I first saw it, I was like, whoa, what are they going to use that for? Nothing. They, uh, they never come back to it. Great. For this event, 1945 gets bronze, Identity gets silver, and 1965 most definitely gets gold. Before the final event, let's tally up the points so far. Hmm. Well, I don't think 1974 is going to win anything. 1945 is in third place, Identity is in second, and... 2015 and 1965 are tied for first. Looks like one of these will be the champion.
As mentioned before, each murder method used in the book alludes to a verse in the nursery rhyme Ten Little Indians slash Soldier Boys. Most of the films keep this plot device, though they don't all retain the poem in its original form. Ten little Indians went out to dine. One choked his little self, and then there were nine. Apart from identity, all the films have Anthony, or his equivalent, killed by cyanide poisoning. Even one of the parodies starts off with this incident. Sort of. Ten little roosters all gathered to dine. One choked on his rage, and then there were nine. Nine little soldier boys stayed up late. One overslept, and then there were eight. This prophesies the death of Ethel Rogers, who dies in her sleep from an overdose of medication. They keep this in 1945 and 2015, but in 1965 they change it to One Ran Away, and then there were eight. So here the maid tries to get away from the mountain, and this happens. The new rhyme doesn't make too much sense, but it works for the story. Ethel runs away again in 1974, and therefore she's... strangled. What? Eight little soldier boys traveling in Devon. One said he'd stay there, and then there were seven. I don't actually quite get this line. The third victim is the general, and he's bludgeoned to death, which again is kept in 1945 and 2015. Well, actually in 1945 he's stabbed. I just don't see the connection to the line in the poem. Eight little Indian boys traveling in Devon. One said he'd stay there, and then there were seven. The old soldier stayed here, didn't he? Yeah, nice try. The general's also stabbed in 1965, and they changed the line to... Eight little Indians travel into heaven. One met a pussycat, and there were seven. Met a pussycat? Where did that come from? That's stupid. Makes no sense. Oh my god, it's so cute. I want to pet it. Oh my god, oh, it's so precious. Okay, I'm cool with it. Meanwhile, 1974 mentions the cat, and there's no cat. I'm displeased. Seven little soldier boys chopping up some sticks. One chopped himself in half, er, halves, and then there were six. At this point, it's obvious that 1974 isn't even trying anymore. Rogers hoofs it, but someone's broken his compass and drained his water canteen, so he's toast. 1945 and 2015 retain the original method of splitting his head open with an axe, following the rhyme. In 1965, they change it to the chopper finished one off, and then there were six. And since the murder weapon is still technically an axe, I'm okay with this. Six little soldier boys playing with a hive. A bumblebee stung one, and then there were five. Emily Brent is sedated and then killed by lethal injection. The others find her with a live bumblebee in the room and the sting on her neck. This is retained in 1945 and 2015, minus the live bumblebee in the latter. In 1974, the bee sting is... a poisonous snake? Where's your bumblebee? What? Never mind. What's interesting is how 1965 handles it. The murder method is lethal injection, but the bumblebee is on her bedspread. It's been there the whole time. Clear evidence that you and Owen planned the exact order of victims ahead of time, making this the only adaptation to incorporate that element of the book. Five little soldier boys going in for law. One got in chancery, and then there were four. Lombard's pistol goes missing. They search, but can't find it. Incidentally, 2015's hiding place is not where it was hidden in the book. Before too long, this gun is used to shoot the judge. In this, the adaptations are consistent. In fact, from here on out, most of the films follow the book pretty closely. Four little soldier boys going out to sea. A red herring swallowed one, and then there were three. Dr. Armstrong disappears and a figurine is taken away. Based on the red herring in the poem, the survivors presume the doctor is trying to trick them into thinking he's dead. Three little soldier boys walking through a zoo. A big bear hugged one, then there were two. In the book, Blore is crushed to death by a marble clock shaped like a bear. 
1965 comes closest to this by crushing him with a carving of a bear. 1945 crushes him with a stone thingy. In 1974, he's pushed off a cliff. 2015 is kind of cheeky. He gets stabbed to death, and then... I don't know if that counts as hugging. A quick note regarding the zoo. Vera remarks that with the tension wearing on their nerves, the survivors have become paranoid, violent, bestial. So they are the zoo. I do like that in 2015, instead of Vera becoming hysterical and getting slapped, it's Vera who does the slapping. Two little soldier boys playing in the sun. One got all frizzled up, then there was one. The only connection to the rhyme here seems to be that the death occurs outdoors. Vera and Lombard find Armstrong's body, so he couldn't have killed Blore. The murderer must be one of them. Vera gets hold of the gun and... This is the only death that is somewhat reflected in identity. Two of the survivors suspect one another, so they shoot each other, fatally. In a sense, they're both Lombard. One little soldier boy left all alone. He went and hanged himself, and then there were none. The only survivor, Vera goes back into the house and finds... Well... At long last, by default, 1974 finally gets a medal. Bronze goes to 1974. Silver is a tie between 1945 and 2015, which means our ultimate champion is 1965! Woo! It should be noted that 1945 and 2015 both win for closest adaptation of the book, but in my estimation, 1965 is the best film overall. Second place goes to 2015, and 1945 and Identity tie for third. Now, my sister's favorite And Then There Were None adaptation is the 2015 version. So, if she's watching this, then at this moment she's no doubt ranting, THIS IS BULLSHIT! HE'S SO BIASED! And she's right. I, I have tried to be fair, but there is a bias. That's why you should watch these films for yourself, and read the book, and declare your own champion. Except this one. Don't watch this one. There's one other thing I want to mention. 2015 just might have been the perfect adaptation of the novel if it had left the characters' crimes the way they were written, instead of taking away the ambiguity of the actions. Ironically, in a film quite obviously designed to make us uncomfortable, it gave us the deepest kind of comfort of all. By turning these characters into literally bloody-handed murderers, we can't really consider them to be normal ordinary people, unlike in the book, where, in spite of what they've done, they're quite a bit like us. Thanks for sticking with me to the end. I hope you'll join me for the next one. So long!